Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to Faith Church. I'm so glad you're here for our evening service this Good Friday. We're going to have a scripture reading from Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 3. So today is Good Friday, um, and we'll be talking about uh, the death of Jesus and what this means. And it's impossible to really understand what the significance of Jesus' death is without really understanding kind of the backdrop. Um, and the backdrop is that he is our Passover lamb. Um, and when the, when the Jews were captive to Egypt, um, there, there were many plagues that uh, God brought upon Egypt and they would not release the Israelites. And the, the final plague was that of the death angel that would come and would take the firstborn son of every household that did not have the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. And so Moses instructed the people of Israel from God's instruction to put the blood of a lamb on the, the top and the sides of their doorposts using a reed. And they would put this there. And when the death angel came by the house, it would pass over. It would not go into that house. It would not take the firstborn child. Um, and to remember this, Moses instructed the people here in Exodus 12, after this event had taken place, that this is going to be something that we don't just forget. This is going to be something that will be remembered for all generations, that God has done this great, things, he, this great thing. He has saved his people. So it says in Exodus 12, starting in verse 3, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons. According to each man's need, you, ma you shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it in the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat. Then they shall eat of the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in the fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall not let any, you shall, you shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist and sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so you shall eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover." For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for not forgetting your people uh, so long ago. Um, we remember this event of, of the Passover um, as we reflect on its significance, but we, we recognize on this side of, of the resurrection, on this side of your word being revealed through your son, Jesus, um, that it's not just about a lamb, but it, it was about your son who would come and would take on the sins of all humanity, which would be placed upon him, and that he would die, and that his blood would be shed, and that you would offer freely to cover our sins, to atone for us. Father, today we remember this act of love and of compassion and of mercy that you've had on us. 
though we're so undeserving. Father, we praise you for this mighty act. We want to worship you tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. sing a few um, worship songs tonight and try to focus on the cross.
these songs that I picked for tonight, um, what they showed kind of the progression that every Christian has to go through in relation to the cross. You know, at first we sang about the Redeemer on the cross. And first, you really have to see the cross. You have to look at it with all the horrible things that go along with it. It's not fun to look at. It's hard when you think about what Jesus went through. And you have to realize that he did all that for you. Because he loved you, he took that punishment that you deserve. And then once you've done that, then you can come we just saying now because I see the cross and I understand it, I can lay my burdens down there I can put it down and once I've done that then the cross becomes beautiful in my eyes then I can say oh the wondrous cross because it's not just a, a symbol of pain and agony anymore it's the symbol of our redemption so let's sing this last song the wonderful cross
Hey, if you would, join me in Luke 22. And uh, don't worry, we haven't fast-forwarded to the 22nd week of the year. Uh, we're just skipping forward because it is Good Friday. Uh, I, I traveled uh, last weekend to speak in Arizona uh, at our sister church um, in Buckeye, Arizona, just outside of Phoenix. And every time you travel, there are so many details that you have to line up beforehand. You've got to pack and make sure that you have clothes to wear that are appropriate for the occasion. Um, and when you're going to speak in front of a group of people, that means you need to pack your shoes and your suit and your tie and that kind of thing. Um, you need to make sure that you know where you're going uh, to depart, where your airport is. But for me, one of the things that's at the very top of the list that I need to figure out in my planning for a trip is where I'm going to get coffee along the way. Um, you, you think I'm kidding, but like I have to make sure that there are good places to get cups of coffee on my journey. Uh, because the last thing I want to do is get stuck before having to make this long trip, um, get on a long plane ride, and not have any coffee. Um, in the passage that Pastor Eric read to you earlier, they were eating a meal, and they were putting the blood from the lamb over the doorpost, but they were also supposed to eat that meal ready to go. They were to have their shoes on. They were to have um, their belt tightened. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't prefer to tighten my belt before a big meal. I like to loosen it or maybe just put on sweatpants, you know. And so they were to be ready to go. This meal of the Passover meal was a meal before they were going to begin a giant trek through the wilderness to God's promised land. And the passage that we're about to read, this is having a final meal with his disciples that will prepare him and them for the journey ahead as well. They're not about to go on some long trek, but Jesus is about to face something very heavy. I want you to see his words here in this passage. Luke 22 and verse 14 says, the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with them. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man whom he is betrayed. Jesus reframes the Passover meal as being about him. A Passover is all about looking back. And Passover is this meal, this festival that the people would participate in to look back at God's redemption, rescue of them out of Egypt. But during this Passover meal, Jesus is looking forward. Jesus is looking to what is about to happen. Jesus is thinking about what is just around the corner. Jesus knows that he is about to suffer. And truly, that first Passover and every Passover since, while it looked back at their rescue from Egypt, it was also looking forward to this moment when Jesus would be the Passover lamb. Jesus says, I have desired to have this meal with you 
before I suffer. And then Jesus goes into the garden to pray. And we see in this moment just how heavy this is on him. Look down at verse 39 with me. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. And his disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. In the book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, Pete Scazzaro says that our bodies often know what we are feeling emotionally before our brain does. That our body often has an indication of what's going on in our soul before our mind can communicate it. He says oftentimes our bodies act as major prophets about what we are feeling. It's for this reason that maybe before you would even say, I'm feeling really nervous, your stomach starts to tie in knots. Or perhaps before you would even be able to communicate, I'm feeling afraid, you start to feel cold and clammy or shiver. Or perhaps without even recognizing that you're stressed, you come home from a hard day at work and your neck is so tight. Sometimes we can't put into words that we're grieving, but there's this heaviness in our chest. Jesus doesn't speak a whole lot about what he's experiencing here. We have the words from his prayer, and we have the fact that Luke tells us he's in agony. We have that he says to the disciples, before I suffer, we know that this is on his mind, but Jesus' body makes it pretty clear what he's feeling. What Jesus experiences is this condition where because of the great stress that he is under, the capillaries near the surface of his skin begin to burst, and as he perspires, blood is mixed with sweat. Jesus is feeling an incredible heaviness in this moment. Over the past eight months, I've seen the doctor numerous times. And every time I see them, I do a battery of tests and they draw my blood and they measure it and they examine it. And the purpose of all of this is to figure out why exactly on one morning this past July, I just collapsed. And we've figured out that it's related to my thyroid. We've figured out that I have Graves disease. What we figured out is why all of that happened. And it seems clearer and clearer that it was the result of stress, that this heavy burden of leading the church through the pandemic was beginning to weigh on me physically. Even if we had had a conversation about it in that moment, I would have said, everything's going pretty great comparatively. You know, I mean, it's okay. But my body knew more than I did. Here, Jesus knows what he's experiencing, what he's feeling. We don't have much communicated about it, but his body is telling us, screaming to us, this heaviness that he feels. And this heaviness is so palpable that when Jesus goes back to see the disciples, he finds them sleeping. And oftentimes we read this and we're like, come on, disciples, you can do better than this. Jesus needs you in this moment, and you've fallen asleep. Where are you at? But Luke, who's interviewed these disciples, he's talked to the apostles, he's talked to them about this moment. He says that they fell asleep for 
sorrow, that they were overwhelmed with the heaviness of this moment. I mean, and think about what they've just experienced. Jesus has told them that he is the new Passover lamb. Jesus has told them that one of them is a betrayer. They've watched Jesus pray. They can see the, the, the level of heaviness that is upon him. Perhaps they can see that he is sweating drops of blood. It is just so heavy. You ever been in a room where the tension is so thick you can cut it with a knife? Here, Jesus and the disciples are in the garden and the heaviness is so thick that it lays over them like a heavy blanket and all they want to do in this moment is just sleep it off. And this is what Jesus is experiencing before his arrest. Before anyone has laid a hand on him. Before anyone has whipped him. This is what's happening the night before he'll be tried, made fun of, mocked, denied, embarrassed, beaten, whipped, tortured, and eventually killed. Why is Jesus going through all of this this emotional turmoil, this great heaviness? which is only a prelude to the physical torment and pain that he will suffer on the cross. Why? Why in this moment when Jesus is praying in the garden does he say, Lord, your will be done? Why when they come to arrest him and Peter acts and cuts off the ear of a servant, does Jesus tell him to stop and then heal the servant? Because in the beginning of our Bibles, there's another story about a garden. In the beginning of our Bibles, there's the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. And Satan appears and he tells them that they should eat of the tree. He tells them that if they eat of the tree, that they will receive what they've always wanted. That they will power beyond their wildest dreams, that they will be satisfied. They look at the tree and they see that it is pleasant to the eyes and good for food, desired to make one wise. It is hitting all the right buttons. And so they eat of the tree and they feel shame and despair. And God shows up and he says, I will send a son of woman who will destroy the works of this snake. And by the way, if you've attended Faith Church for a while, you know that I absolutely hate snakes. And I believe that I have theological grounds for this hatred of snakes. Last weekend, we went for a hike in the White Tank Mountains in Arizona, and we came upon a rattlesnake. Now, when I say we came upon a rattlesnake, I mean other people in the group found the rattlesnake and I stayed 25 feet away. Even though I was 25 feet away, they poked it with a stick and the rattlesnake rattled its rattle and I jumped out of my skin. And I felt more confirmation than ever that snakes are evil. And they should be destroyed. And so in Genesis 3.15, when God shows up and says that he will send his son, the son of a woman, to crush the head of a snake. It's a powerful verse, but not just because it's a snake, it's because it's going to destroy the works of the devil. And so Jesus comes to be that lamb. And here in the garden, in this moment... He is saying, I will destroy the works of Satan. And what he's doing is he's providing an alternative to what Satan offered to Adam and Eve. Satan said, Adam and Eve, take of the tree and eat. Take this and eat and you will be satisfied. And what the world has been telling mankind ever since is take this and you'll have power. Take this and you'll feel impressive. Take this, and you'll be filled. Take this, and you'll be satisfied. Take and eat. Take and eat. Take and eat. 
And even God's people, when they found themselves without anything to eat, God had provided a way for them to Egypt where there was grain that had been provided for them, and they would go to Egypt where they could be fed, but that would turn into bondage, and God would have to rescue them from Egypt through the Passover lamb. You see, the world is always offering us things that bring destruction and bondage. But Jesus comes. And what does he say to the disciples? He comes, and in this final meal with them, this final Passover meal with them, he says, take and the same offer that Satan made and the same offer that this world makes again and again, Jesus has made possible that we might take and eat. The people in Egypt, they would take and eat the lamb that had been slain and the blood put over the doorpost and it would give them sustenance. It would give them the food needed to journey ahead. Jesus would come and he would be crucified on the cross to make the way for us, and he would say, I am your bread. I am your water. I am the cup. I am the bread. Take and eat. And so Jesus goes through this passion in the garden, and he goes so that he can offer us food and drink that does not bring destruction and bondage but life. And so on this Good Friday, as we think about Jesus dying for us on the cross, thing that we take communion together and remember that he has done this so that we might take and eat. That in him we might have life. And in him we might find the bread of life, which gives us true satisfaction. At this time, Ryan and Stephanie are going to come and they're going to prepare to sing a final song. And as they're getting ready, I'm going to say a prayer over our communion. And after the prayer, I'm going to encourage you to take communion in remembrance of the sacrifice that Jesus made. I encourage you to open the top. We'll open up the bread and take the bread and then open the next layer, which will open the cup so that you can drink of it. And as Ryan and Stephanie are singing and they're singing about the lamb, I want you to just take a moment, remain seated, think about what communion signifies. Think about what Christ has done for us. Take communion. Take and eat. And once you've done that, feel free to join them in song about the lamb that was slain for us. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather and remember. And Lord, we're so grateful that you were willing to sacrifice to feel this heavy burden. Lord, to feel this heaviness of the cross, this torment, this pain. And Lord, I ask that we would be so mindful of the sacrifice made for us. Lord, that recognizing the costliness and the heaviness of the cross, Lord, that we would be primed to celebrate the victory of the empty tomb. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Take and eat.
I've always loved SM Lockridge as a sermon. It's only Friday, but Sunday's coming. And in it, he talks about the heaviness of Friday and the joy of Sunday. And so our Good Friday service is a time that we want to feel that heaviness. And it always feels a little awkward to walk out with that heaviness still hanging. But that's what the disciples on Friday And then there was the despair of Saturday. And so that joyful celebration on Sunday, um, just so powerful. And so we're going to dismiss here in a word of prayer in just a moment. And I hope that kind of as you go through this weekend, I don't want you to feel heavy or sad all weekend, but I do want you to feel the weight of Christ's sacrifice for us. And then I look forward to gathering with you on Sunday to celebrate his resurrection, his victory over death, hell, and the grave. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the time that we've had to be reflective upon that night and day of your arrest, crucifixion, Lord, I pray that over the next couple of days as we have time to reflect upon your your final words on the cross, Lord, you calling out, Lord, I pray that we we would just recognize how costly our sin is. Lord, how heavy the cross was. And as a result, Lord, we would come with hearts just overjoyed to worship you and celebrate the wonderful things you have done on our behalf and for us. Father, thank you that we're able to sing your praises and sing of the cross and sing of your blood being spilt and sing of your sacrifice. Uh, Lord, may we not um, just gloss over those things. May we feel them and think on them deeply Because we know that that makes our appreciation and our uh, uh, understanding, our, our worship of you that much more profound. And Lord, you are worthy of all of it. And so Lord, I ask that you would bring us back together on Sunday with hearts that are overflowing with joy and gratitude for the grace that you have won for us. Father, I pray that you would bless each of these families, Lord, as they have time to spend together tonight, tomorrow, this weekend. Lord, I pray that there would be times of of sweetness and gladness and times of remembering what you've done. Lord, help us to speak of these things to our children so that they might grab hold of them and remember them and believe them. Lord, bless our congregation. Bring us back together on Sunday. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.